So how you been, man? I'm, to be honest, let me first, out of the back, huge fan. I'm so grateful that you actually agreed to do this. I feel like it's honestly a treat. So I want to thank you so much. But how's things with you? Good. Uh, uh, you know, just living the bunker lifestyle. Uh, now, thanks. To, though I really don't think my life has changed at all since all this COVID business because I work from home anyway. So it's just... Uh, Yep. I was going to say, do you see, do you, do you work mainly more of like a, not necessarily an introvert, but you, you just, everything you need is within the house. So the pandemic doesn't necessarily affect you too much in terms yeah, of your work schedule. Also, I mean, it's South Australia, so face it. <laughs> uh, um, there's not much out there anyway. Uh, I haven't been, I heard Adelaide's okay. That you, yeah, Adelaide's fine. It's just, there's a cliche that, you know, South Australia is pretty grim. Um, Right, uh, but you know we're we're leading the charge with a corona-free state at the moment, so that's pretty good. Did you plan to do the Audible se- series before Corona? Obviously, like, or did that? Yeah, of just course. Come you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we 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 scheduled the release of the virus uh, very carefully. Uh, I was thinking, like, oh, you, you were trying to do the TV show, and then the pandemic happened. Then you're like, oh crap, what are we going to oh, do? Better just, and then, yeah. Uh, Better turn off the video and get cheap. <laughs> Damn, because I was I was going to ask you. I was hoping for a season. Three yeah, no, we we definitely we definitely maneuvered, you know, uh, into the audio realm. We're that good at and that fast at career adaptation. <laughs> How long was the the audio audible season in development? Does it take longer compared to the TV show? So it was fast. It was significantly faster. Uh, basically, one way or another, Audible approached us at the end of 2018 um, and said, you know, do you think Danger 5 would, would work as, a, as an audio um, production? And we put together a pitch, you know, pretty rapidly in a couple of weeks because I mean, we, we already knew what we were dealing with material-wise and, and, and we just came up with an angle on what the what the show actually would be and what style it was going to be and what part of the story world. Then it was commissioned, like, well, they gave us a, they commissioned a, a pilot script from us, um, which w- took a couple of months to put together and then based on the pilot script, the series was commissioned and... We wrote everything in about three months, I think. Uh, so okay. the eight episodes, which is really, you know, it took us a year to write each season of the television show. So it, it was super fast in comparison and quite a different methodology. Um, so it was a, it, the whole process from initiation of um, anything from Audible to delivery was just over a year. Damn. Okay. I was going to say, is it different, obviously, with writing the TV show compared to the Audible, were you worried that you were had to explain everything because it's like, well, people well, people can't see this now. And, um, okay, how do, I, how do I do this? And I guess having an, the narrator... Does that ease a lot of that in terms of, because I mean. We knew Sean, that could, that was already in our pitch. Like we just, we, David and I had to think about, okay, how are we going to translate this to the audio realm? And since it is such an intensely visual show and there are really stupid situations uh, that occur throughout that would be quite uh, it, nebulous to to figure out if you had absolutely no frame of reference and no vision whatsoever we we knew that we needed a narrator just for those key moments to bookend scenes and uh sort of um telegraph major beats of stupid visual action so then we could let Mm. the characters just kind of be funny in the scenes rather than having to carry a burden of Oh my God, is that Dracula on a surfboard? Yes, it's Dracula <laughs> on a surfboard. And like, he, he, you know, you know I, I sort of, from, the, from my experience of listening to audio dramas, I, I find um, if you can include a narrator to stop the characters from having to fucking describe everything, then it's, it's quite relieving and the audience is completely fine with that, <laughs> you know. Um, I, this was my first uh, like audio kind of, uh, drama it's it was, it was it was amazing to just kind of like 
literally the theory of the mind that I was thinking of like, and I was wondering why isn't this more popular? And I'm thinking it's so zany that, you know, like Draco on, on the surfboard or the, the outback to hell, the whole that episode. And how do you film that in a live action sequence? I'm like, okay, that, that's very hard. Would you do animation? Is that something that, because I was thinking. Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I, I agree. Um, well, one of our criteria for the content in the show was all of our ideas have to be too big for live action. So justified, right? This is audio. We can do whatever the hell we want. Let's make these <laughs> concepts exactly as surreal as possible to the extent that, I mean, we pushed the boundaries in the, the live action show of designing gags that were almost impossible to film and hence you know our, our sort of shitty aesthetic was a way around that you know yeah. um but yeah i think the only way that the, the the program could live on in another capacity is as an animated series because uh frankly it's actually very difficult to to pitch live action and sorry not pitch to sell live action television shows that are half hour comedy operate strongly in a genre space rather than a, a realistic space and include a large amount of surreal components. There are very, very few shows in the marketplace that actually get away with doing that. Mm. Um, whereas with animation, people are ready to accept genre and they're ready to accept absurdity and sort of more surreal components. Uh, for some reason so yeah i almost wish it, now that you mentioned i'm trying to think is there a show live action like danger fire that maybe the mighty bush is kind of up there with that absurd yeah, only other other what? extinct show uh like <laughs> the know. bush uh, red dwarf is one of the closest and i believe that still is hobbling along now but you know is well and truly out of the i think it went through the full trough of being a successful show falling out of favor and then getting cult kudos so it's rebootable now based on its so which is kind of what happened to us uh, you know uh, the show was dead for long it wasn't enough successful it, at the beginning when it started it's or? A, it, let's put it this way it's got a cult following it was a cult <laughs> success, which is not Family Guy. Um, so uh, we, you know, it we produ- we started making the first season ten years ago now. Since that's that's why I still so, it's it's to me it's still like I'm so surprised that it like, that it even aired on Australian TV because I was like, man, I, I know Australian TV. We would never have put something like this. Not. In the, in, in say it's terrible, it's more like wow. No, I'm so a, glad they took the risk and did uh, something like this. Like this is. I agree, and uh, by no means is it a qualification of the, the quality of the show by any means. But it is a miracle that we ended up on television at all. Because um, if we tried to pitch exactly the same thing today, it's not going to happen. It was just mm. anybody. I think it, 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 it's always a matter of luck in this business, whether or not you get something up and yeah. we had the right things happened at the right time in the right order to be able to get that show made. Um, so, cause, you know. cause even like Michael Cusack, who you worked with and, and his stuff and they're like, mm. I mean, <laughs> he went onto YouTube and putting up, put up stuff like the YOLO is incredible, but no way would that air on Australian TV, something like that's like adult swim. And I think, yes, that, he's got two, he's of, had two adult swim pilots now. Um, his YOLO crystal fantasy and smiling friends, which have both done really well. So yeah, he's, he's smiling been friends. very Did successful. You? Yeah. I, lo- I love some smiling friends. I think it's awesome. <laughs> I think it's a great combination of him and Zach Hadel. Um, psychic pebbles their their styles sort of merged really fluently and it's it's awesome to see people two two insane minds be able to riff off each other like that is that how you were like i would just i just want to work with him because i want to use him for one of these audible series and like Um, he's you know how did that come about because he's we've been sorry going friends we've been friends for a while um after YOLO and then Damo and Darren came out. Damo and Darren, or Siggy Butt Brain, or however it's referred to, was came out in when we were in post production on season two of Danger Five, which was right. 2014. And I just reached out to Michael because I said, oh, you know, your stuff's really funny. And then we tried to, we developed a show together. Like we 
brought him to Adelaide and worked on something together for a week and it was a show that we pitched and it never went anywhere but it was sort of a like a animated adult animation like an Australian Simpsons basically um oh. uh and it didn't it didn't get off the ground but mm. and just sort of we've been to America together at the same time kind of doing business and stuff and yeah I don't, I don't know Michael's just great and it was a no-brainer we wanted him to have wanted to have him in one of these episodes because I we couldn't think of anybody better to play a 14 year old Merlin <laughs> his voice is so distinct I, I, just, I could hear it in my head what have you what have you been working on the last five years that you can kind of tell us and sense since oh, the because I mean because I was surprised to even see that Danger 5 had returned reading that so like, uh, that you didn't want to do it and I was like and I was like oh okay damn you know like I would I loved like the show and, and would would have loved to see it continue, but I was also interested to see what else what else can we can we see? I mean Italian Spider Man seems like it's not gonna come back, even though I wish I wish. <laughs> can that highly unlikely. <laughs> highly <are> you... unlikely. <laughs> unless <laughs> somebody unless a Marvel knocks on the door and says, Here's a hundred million dollars. <laughs> I am not sure. Isn't it a parody? Like, how is that not just legally okay to do? I guess Marvel. It's not legally okay. Oh, is uh, it? Oh. No, no. It's it's like it's, Italian Spider Man is just. A, a, I have nothing to do with it. It just exists on the internet, and I don't know who made it. So um, people just. Uh, okay, we'll go back to what, were, what, you, what have you been doing for the last five years? Um, you know. Uh, Working in the the coal mine of development, essentially, um, David and I didn't. St- we haven't stopped coming up with things and pitching them in various capacity. We got kind of the the half hour comedy marketplace in Australia kind of stalled out after we finished season two of um, mm. Danger Five. SBS stopped doing half like commissioning new half hour comedies. The streaming market started to disrupt television in a way that made formats kind of a bit all over the place for a while. Um, we kind of put our heads down. We de- we've, I don't know. We've developed about uh, probably 13 different television projects over the last five years or something like that, which have gone from the extent from full pilot scripts for a few of them to short films to whatever. Um, we mm. pitched some of them here. We pitched quite extensively in America. We've had a couple of development deals over there. Um, and lots of series that have come, you know, this close to being a thing um, and then dissolving at the last second, which is kind of just <laughs> par for the course. Um, is that frustrating? You know, yeah, yeah, of course. It's it's very frustrating because, you know, um, in order to get a show up, you have to do a hell of a lot of work up front and that's usually the work that you do for no money. Um, mm. Even if you're in cahoots with a production company, it's more often than not that early, early stuff before you pitch an idea and all of the hard bit, which is figuring out what the hell the show is, mm. you have to kind of conjure from nowhere. And so we did a, done a lot of that, um, a lot of learning written feature scripts um and so it feels like there's nothing to show for it and i am on the imdb page but we've written a hell of a hell of a lot of stuff and worked with a lot of people and um been in a lot of rooms pitching a lot of things and um, have sort of experienced quite the gamut of that that side of the business um I'm surprised now, to see that you have to keep hustling for it after the success of Danger Fire. I'm just like, yeah. just give it to these guys. Everybody always has to keep hustling regardless. It's like you, you have to prove yourself all over again after your next project unless you hit some ridiculous jackpot and, you know, create something like um, Breaking Bad and then you can get away with dripping a TV show out that only has two plot points per episode um thereafter uh you talk about better call Saul. i might be <laughs> um i haven't seen it but i have no, seen breaking bad so it it's it's, like- it's got a, let's just say it has an incredibly leisurely pace um that wouldn't wouldn't be wouldn't be afforded to any uh other filmmakers i think in that position yeah. um 
I think they're anyway, just milking so, the, brand, the brand that came before it and just for what it's worth. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, because this is the age that we live in as well, IP. You know, people, um, it seems that networks and stu- and whoever's buying are, are more and more um, resistant to original ideas um, mm. because they see them as a risk. Um, whereas if you can pivot off of some existing fan- audience for IP, Spin-off. they're already it's it's just it's just leveraging against failure. Um, <laughs> so that's exactly what we've done. Uh, we pitched new ideas along with Danger Five uh, yeah. to Audible, and we had absolutely no hope that any of the other ones would get picked. Um, knowing that it's like, okay, here you go, here's IP that already exists. That's always going to be the thing that people go for. So Right, okay. Um, so there was there potentially very... other Audible drama series. Yeah, that... yeah, yeah. We had a handful of them that went in at the same time, um, you know, with but there was a great degree of certainty that they wanted the mm. Danger 5 idea. Um, uh, yeah, so it... IP is sort of king. At the Are you allowed to just like... I don't know, do it like a cheeky leak, you know, like something like Deadpool where Ryan Reynolds was trying to get it up in the air, but the studio wasn't having it, so he just leaked some test footage and then oh, everyone, right. everyone, the fans were like, oh, this is amazing. Let's let's get this back on, you know, let's give it a, get a show from it. Is that something? Jeez. I mean, I, I want to hear some, all these. Something to leak. Uh, I mean, it's, it's not very exciting to leak a two-pager <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> or, a, or a pilot script or, you know, like... Um, and all of the sh- all of the stuff we've shot, I think we have actually put out there that we just wanted to shoot for the sake of it. To tell the truth, I think all of the short films we've made have been the ideas that absolutely nobody is going to buy, and out of kind of spite, we're like, "Fuck it, we'll just make it anyway" because we think it's funny. So um, a total misdirection of energy. Uh, I reckon. Yeah, do, could you do something that's just literally yourself, like not a short film, but like. Do you have the the resources of the time to? I'm going to make uh, my own little ten minute web web series or something and release it on YouTube. Is that um, anything in your yeah. in your head or? Sure. I mean, we have we like uh, there's no. I would never do uh, never a, never a web series. Web series is sort of an obsolete thing. It's like <laughs> what people go online to watch one video for thirty seconds, maybe. Uh, unless it's um, a recipe or, or, uh, you know, looking for a great class loadout for Call of Duty that they'll sit through. uh, So, I don't know, web series, I think, died. It never never lived. Um, But... I'm thinking maybe more like... uh like Auntie Donna or something like that. I mean, Michael sort of releases these sort of, uh, I don't know, short little animation segments. I don't know if you can call them short films. I guess they kind yeah, of are. Yeah, his but. little bits that he does. I mean, he because I mean, it's it's, it's the gradation. It's the it's the ide- idealistic gradation of the, of the filmmaker's career now in this digital space where you go from making little bits of stupid shit online until people care enough about what you do to mm. leverage into the more legit. So maybe we've just got too much pride and we, we've tried to continually expand the duration of everything that we've produced. I think probably the curve was too steep from Italian Spider-Man to Danger 5 and the course of, what was it, um, uh, six years, you know. Uh, so um, web content, yeah, look, if... Uh, no, not for... I'm, it may, maybe like a self-finance short if it was potent enough mm. and it had it had the ability to upsell into something else like a feature like proof, the proof of concept that kind of thing uh, i'm not trying to convince something. you i was just like i just really really want to see some more stuff from you guys and so hopefully i mean and i presume the second there will be a second audible season given the success and hopefully you guys enjoyed making this one and they haven't asked us yet so we'll see but yeah we could totally do another one it was uh it's quick. It was quick enough. Uh, does it, and, uh, is the recording time just like a week's worth? How long does that take? Yeah, is it that... was uh, seven days to do the eight episodes, and we had mm. basically all of the leads together. Um, so they were live. They were kind. We ran the scenes live, um, 
So, in the same room, sort of? Yeah, like, you bet. All f- we had, a, you know, four microphones in a circle so everybody's facing oh, each other. Awesome. And, um, and we basically, they only, we had one read-through day, um, read all the scripts, then we smashed out sort of an episode and a half every day um, and maybe about three takes of each scene. And then yep. in the edit, I cut the scene so there was a take, you know, there were lines from this take and that take and it was very much like video editing in that That's respect. Amazing. But it, even more so because you can do literally make Franken lines that are like a syllable from here and a bit from there if there was something that needed to be rectified or a performance that could just be made better by an inclusion of another noise that somebody made. Hmm. Um so it was a lot of flexibility in that. It was quite, yeah, quite a, quite a bit of editing. Uh, the editing took freaking ages. It was at least a. It's gonna matter. Yeah, and all the audio just listening like to. A, yeah, it was minimum of three days each ep just to cut the dialogue, and then probably another three days on top of that for our sound designer to do the mm. the rest. How did um, Natasha feel with Ilsa in terms of like were you worried a little bit of the. Uh oh, there's no no subtitles here. We're gonna yep, have to. Yeah, so approached. It's like approached Natasha and said, "Look, nobody can see you. Nobody can understand you. Um, you you're gonna have to use all of your psychic faculties to connect with the audience." And um, I mean, I think it worked. You know, she essentially became Chewbacca. Um, <laughs> so it works. I I think. I mean, I think the only. So. Yeah, and there are some lines of hers that go unexplained by other. She has good lines, I think, too. So for anybody who speaks Russian, assuming that the translations are correct, then there's some other jokes to be found. Uh, what do you mean? You assuming the translations are correct? Is that? <laughs> well, you know, I don't speak Russian, so if the interpreter is capable of a lot of artistic license, and uh, there are some. Choice lines um, like she calls a genie a lamp fart in there, and she says, um, "What else?" God, I, I wish I spoke Russian. Abuse. You know, she says a lot of in- lines that I do not think have a literal interpretation in Russian. Like, right when you translate something to another language, especially one that's you know d- that different to English. Because I'm wondering, I'm wondering if like sometimes lot. you. We'll write something uh, that like someone asks her something and the words that she's saying aren't actually a response. Like the, if you translated them, they would be almost like gibberish or they would just be like something like, like something weird. Are they, but are they actually translated? No, they're, li- they're lines. Like she's, are they, we wrote they are her lines. lines. Okay. So the process originally was, or the pilot, we did not care because it was all about communicating the idea to um to the executives, so we literally put random Cyrillics in there for every one of Ilsa's lines. So, you know, because you have to experience the fact that you've got no idea what she's saying. Um, and then after, when we actually had to write the show, it was like, oh, shit, got to go and write things for her to say. So um, she sort of, on average, has less lines than other characters because okay. I not spend that much time listening to her talk. And it's not genius. contributing to the plot. Um, but your, I, think it work, I think it works. Did your dad have a little bit more to do with, I mean, I was trying to hear his voice because I, I know there's like, it's like an Easter egg that Carmine Russo mm. is somewhere in there. I, is he Electronic Bob? That's my guess. Nah. Who, who, who is no, he? I, Can you reveal? Nah, I'm Electronic Bob. Uh, he's, yeah. um, he's in episode seven with the big cat. Okay. Um, and he's speaking Italian. Speaking so, Italian. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a very um, peripheral character. Because, yeah, because so I only like, um, visually how he looks like, but that's not yeah. his voice from the show. So he's, when the, in this episode seven, he's, uh, it's the, there's, Pierre pulls out the old Italian lady out of his bum bag and then she gets an in, into an argument with the old Italian man and he's the old Italian man. Uh, and uh, he's, actually, okay. he's actually speaking Neapolitan uh, dialect. Um, That's from Naples, is it correct? Or? Yeah, yeah, and um, which is like a sub-language. It's basically not Italian. And then the woman, the girl, the woman playing the 
um, uh, old Italian lady is uh, my friend um, who, who's, who's Italian, who lives in Berlin, and she's a northerner, so she had to kind of, it was very difficult to get her to uh, embody the same level of southern fury that, that my dad could just do because the northerners are very polite. They don't tend to raise their uh, voices. Okay. I'm picturing your dad, like, using a lot of hand ge- gestures as he's yeah, delivering. <laughs> That's it. Um, what about Great for me- radio. Great for radio. <laughs> what about Mackenzie? Will he next season or anything like that? I mean, I haven't thought about Mackenzie. No. Good. I mean, he'd just Good. be as as uh, we have. That would be great to add another character that people cannot can't understand. Um, <laughs> uh, Till they all start speaking like not not English. No. I think the only conversation David and me have had about reintroducing Mackenzie would be he he'd. Pre- potentially be some kind of a Q-esque character who's, you know, the head of... He's responsible for supplying Danger 5 gadgets and shit. Oh, yeah. I, I could see that. That's interesting. I mean, I mean, the time period's a little bit, but I just want, to, I just want Mackenzie. I yeah, thought that... Yeah, justify um, his appearance. Just, <laughs> just so I'll get him in. I thought the fake advertisements... Uh, were incredible in this this season. This was insane. I, had, I mean, I would normally look for them in the first season at the towards the end. I was so grateful that they were like in between. Like almost, it was like just like a pause, and like they went for like a solid good minute and a half. It's how, I just how do you come up with those ideas? And so like one of the best ones was the home and li- the home invasion one liners. <laughs> Whose oh, was yeah. that? Whose was that? <laughs> Is that yours uh, or David? I don't know. Uh, oh, they're an amalgam, you know, like somebody has one idea and then it gets bounced back and forward and especially with these ads because um, I would often draft an episode and then like do the first draft and then there would be lots of shrapnel. Like, oh, so I'm, the fuck, I'm, I'm not going to spend time on doing these ads right now. So throw in <laughs> random concepts and then David would come back with something else and then I'd come back with something else and we'd end up with the home invasion. That, I don't know, the home invasion. I think the, if you look at the advertisements, it's, a, it's, a, it's their, a better idea of kind of, that, that's a good indication of David and my home base kind of sense of humour because it exists outside of the Danger 5 story world. So it's the way we could just pull in stupid jokes that we make anyway mm. and try and <laughs> use them in a, in, in, out of context. So um, they're fun. It was like a break from uh, having, to do, having to do just stick to the Danger 5 rules. I, I like them. I think Sean McAuliffe has something similar with Matt as hell. He does these fake yeah. ABC ads and I'm like, oh man, this is so, this is so much. It's so good. Want? You can see he it's just so gets good. to do whatever he wants for a moment and, and, you know, relive the kind of McAuliffe program freedom of just doing really stupid shit. Uh, that, that, that's it. That's it. Have you ever thought about doing a Danger 5 movie? Has that ever come up I'm, as an idea? It's never come up. Um, it would bankrupt us all. Um, <laughs> How maybe would it bankrupt? What do you mean? Dino, De, Dino De Laurentiis's daughter maybe could finance it. Or there's we, Roger Corman, he's still alive. Maybe he'd do it. Um, I know. Who are you talking about? <laughs> uh-huh. At these... <laughs> They're they're like producers famous. Or? No, they're just they're the kind of producers that would fund something like that once upon a time, and I don't know if that sort of genre of producer exists anymore. Okay, uh, so I don't know. I don't. There's no practical uh, avenue to do one as it stands, Fair enough. You, nor an you, idea for one. No, yeah, okay. Well, huh. I'll, I feel like it could be like the community movie where they like keep. The fans are always trying to get a movie oh, to yeah. happen. To a, oh, really? That's a thing? They Okay. Six yeah. seasons and a movie. So I don't think uh, Dan Har- Harmon would be jumping on that anytime soon. No, I don't think so. How was it um, working? Did you do much directing when it comes to the audio form? Like you're doing, are you directing them, how they say the lines, or is that someone else now? Cause, or is that... What's no, no, like? it's all in house. It's uh, yeah, I directed everybody. Um, very similar to directing on you know for TV, but you, you 
can worry about the performance. I tend to, I think my my weakness as a screen director is I tend to ignore the performances because so much other shit is going on a lot of the time. It's just like, yeah, actors will take care of themselves. It'll be fine. Um, um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was good. It was a good environment and everybody knew their characters so well and had been there and done that. So there was very little direction needed. Spent most of the time trying to figure out what I was going to do for my characters when they came up. Did you prefer the writing or the directing side of it? Or do you see them two to get connected? Yeah, it's a whole part of the process. It's nice to go through the ecosystem of the production process. It would suck to be doing the same thing over and over. <laughs> I was, <laughs> was going to say, uh, um, what are some other Aussie creators that you know that you would champion? Have you seen like the Big Les show? There's another one. Oh yeah, I'm a big, big fan of. Shows. Yeah, that's great. They've been doing more stuff. I thought they got some bona fide output. They got some Did they? finance. I know. That. Yeah, I, think I think they, they had so. the. Mike Nolan show, something like that. Right. I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. It was the spin-off. Another case of a leveraging familiar <laughs> kind of territory, it seems like. Of course, use what you've got. But um, yeah, they're, they're awesome. Um, Friendly Geordies is really cool. Know, oh, yeah. Yeah. Bit, uh, Jordan, Jordan, uh, Jordan Shanks. Jordan Shanks, that's it, yeah. yeah. I even follow his self-help channel. It's, it's really good, but he's... Oh, it's he's a been, separate one. Right. It's a separate one, so check that out because he's. I think I was uh, back in the friendly Geordie's days when he was doing like these very obscure characters, and in his just at his like house, and now mm. he's just pumping it out just day by day. He's doing great. Yeah. But if yeah, you haven't yeah. seen his self help one, definitely. I've not. I'll look it up. Look it up. I mean, not sure if you need any self help, but it seems like some every, interesting topics. <laughs> every moment. Uh, <laughs> Have you seen uh, the, anything of Michael Cusack's Yol, the Crystal one? I remember you bringing it up before, but it, oh yeah, I've, yeah, I've seen the the pilot. Uh, oh damn, it's great! I haven't it's, seen this. Is it, has it released or is this? Yeah, yeah, they screened it. They screened it on Adult Swim, of course, which you know we have no way of seeing anything on there. I think, yeah. though, I think you can VPN and get away with pretending to be an American on the Adult Swim website, so you might be able to see it there. Um, okay. But I love it. It's it's sort of it's like um, YOLO upgraded with a sort of fantasy component. So hence the oh, crystal fantasy. It's, perfect um, for animation, it sounds like. Yeah, you bet. Yeah. Um, have you seen, are you a fan of Chris Lilly's work, Summer Heights High? Or not so yeah. much? Yeah, absolutely. I love Summer Heights High. Yeah, it was great. Nice. It was yeah. one of the last sort of shows to hang out for back in the day. I was going to say, I remember seeing that coming out and everyone in high school just making those those jokes that of, of Jono and I don't know if, if it was that popular for you guys, but it was it was huge. I, it's like almost like Borat when people coming out and everyone's like high five and everyone's running, you know, puck you miss and all that. So anyways. Yeah, it um, was, I used to go, you know, it was something I would go around to my friend's place to watch regularly. I mean, I was 20. 21, I think, when that came out or something like that. So it was beyond the realms of didn't get to see it affect the high school cohort. Fair but enough. It was, a great, you, it was a great show. When you had the when you worked with Sean McAuliffe on this one, was he the first person that you thought of when it was like, we need a narrator? No, yep. It has to be Sean. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it was. It was no no brainer. He still, still says he loves the mm-hmm. show. Like, I think he still says that it's – the best show that he's ever seen. I, I, st- I still don't believe that that, that <laughs> has happened. Like I, I don't still don't actually believe I've worked with him. Uh, for all I know, it could still be just a strange dream. Uh, <laughs> he's just such a pleasant person to work with as well. It's just, he's just too good to, it's, it's too good like- to be true. The whole package too good to be true. Very suspicious of it. It's probably not even him on the recordings. It's an impersonator. It doesn't make yeah. sense. He wouldn't. He wouldn't work on something like this. I love that you're still in Adelaide and not like in in some fancy Hollywood apartment or like oh. going to Sydney or something. <laughs> Is Adelaide in lockdown? <laughs> what's your uh, what's God? I was I was going to say, no, what's your daily routine like 
do you have any habits or do you do you try and write every day or is it just come to you or do you do you, what are you habits life? jesus yeah it's a constant struggle of trying to uh, you know avoid habits uh <laughs> if you uh you know wake up no well it's fine but i think every see now i think everybody now thanks to corona has been given the gift of an insight into the daily life of a writer in terms because of like i think secluded there's no from di- everyone secluded from the world generally misanthropic um wake up and trying to figure out wait a minute what am I doing with my life uh, every morning? Um, and then once you overcome that, then attempt to write. And uh, yeah, like such, look, depending if there's a pro- it, it's difficult. It's difficult to. It'd be great to write something every day, and in some capacity, I do. But um, usually, there needs to be a project in order to make that a reality because it, it, there's the motivation and the context needed to get something done, or it could be a self-created project like trying to write a feature like a spec script reading try and do a substantial if i'm not writing anything i try and do a substantial amount of reading mm. um that, that fuels the fire like uh, fiction or non-fiction both uh I, I like to listen to non-fiction like with the audible or whatever with audible, yeah. um, and um uh, i can't for some reason mean i can't listen to fiction i, I have to read that for real even I, I have a Kindle, but I, I like used it ferociously for about a year, and then I was like, just started wanting to hold a book again. Uh, it's a different experience. I like the smell of a book, even though it's I a have great like smell. A, <laughs> I feel like a lot of people say that it just sounds so weird. Um, any advice for current wannabe filmmakers that want to come out? What are your general thoughts? Is you sound very. <laughs> I was like, I like, it's enthusiastic about the secluded lifestyle of a, of a writer, but oh yeah, yeah. Be prepared for a lifestyle of like isolation and pain. Uh, like if you're not, if you if you're getting into it for anything else, oh uh, yeah, you'd, you'd be mad. What do you? Yeah, you'd be you'd be insane. Um, uh, you, like you just have to create. You just have to make stuff. Full stop. Yeah, that's. Ground zero, especially when you're when you're not when you've done nothing. Nobody's going to give you a chance until they see what you've done in any capacity. And now it's easier than ever to just do something. Um, do you think uh, the Italian Spider Man helped you guys get Danger Five a little bit? Oh, it was directly responsible. It's like a, it's a yeah. straight line from one to the other. Without it, it didn't. It's and but I mean, Italian Spider Man is also a chain reaction of a lot of other shit that happened before it. So mm. your career in one way or another. Was... No, no, no. It was the, it was another short in a long series of short films. Mm. Um, so everything you do, you do stuff and you get it out there and you try and meet people who are doing the things that you want to be doing. Um, you create a kind of chain reaction and a momentum that you will go forever and there are points at which that momentum is going to stop or, and you have to push the ball back up the hill again and... And that's always just going to be based on your own, your own output. If you want to be a creator, like a a writer, mm. director, or, or or a writer, um, yeah. And it's going to be inconsistent, regardless. No matter how successful you get, yeah, it's, it's all, you always be you always be hustling. Always, always be hustling. It's amazing. Mm. Um, would you be interested? I've got. A, Couple of quizzes here. One specific to Danger Five. I was going to test your knowledge on Pierre's drinks. Do you know right. Pierre's drinks? And the other one is uh, some very obscure Australian expressions that I've okay. come across. Yeah, for both of those. Okay. Yeah, sure. I, I'll probably fail both miserably, but I'll give it a shot. <laughs> All right, let's go with the Australian ones first. Mm-hmm. Let's go with an easy one. What? If I'm doing an Aussie salute, what is an Aussie salute? Aussie salute. Aussie salute. Jesus. I don't know. I've never heard of that. Um, um, if you're flashing somebody your ass. <laughs> I wish. So, <laughs> but it is waving the flies away. Oh, that's a good one. Waving the flies away. Yeah. The Aussie salute. Nice. Ankle biter. 
ankle biter is, uh, I assume that's just, it's a kid. Yes. A child, Good. a baby, it's potentially a, anything yep. like that. Yeah. Good. Excellent. It wasn't you got, fetish. One, <laughs> you got one out of two. If you're grown okay. up like a mushroom. Grown up like a mushroom? Yeah. Um, grown up like a mushroom. Can you give me a sentence? You, you've, like, um, you've been grown like you were, like you've, you've had a child, you know, not necessarily a child, but you've grown up or you've been in an environment like a mushroom. You've, Something's oh. in your life. You've grown up like a mushroom. Oh, is it? So you haven't had to deal with much hardship, or like get so sort of more like any quickly. Any other... Okay, no, nah, I bombed it. <laughs> Kept in the dark and fed on BS. Oh, that's a good one. There you go. There that's you go. a good one. Kept in um, the dark. <laughs> uh, let's go with grown what's up this? like a mushroom. Yeah, you can feel free to use it. Thanks. Um, I think I've seen it. This is my citizenship test and I'm failing. I know this should be on the citizenship test. Mm. What's the what's the John Dory? What's the story? Is that just the rhyming slang? Yeah. Yes, it is. For some reason a lot of Aussies the few of expressions that I've known, they're just kind of like they don't want to say it, they want to say the rhyme of it. Almost Mm. like a code for some I have no Mm. clue. Um you should go go to the long drop. What's the long go drop? Go to the long drop. It's the, just the toilet, right? Yes. There you go. I think you're up to two or three. I'm not sure. Nice. Better than <laughs> nil. I'll get two more to go. See, see if you get these. Excellent. Shanks, All right. Shanks Pony. Shanks Pony? Yeah. Shanks something. Not a rhyming one, this one, unfortunately. No, it's not. Shank's pony. Is that is it a, a, a pony that belongs to Shank? Or is it... Who, who's Shank? Like That's what some... I mean. Like, is, how is, is there an apostrophe after... Sh- is it Shank's? Oh, it's... Uh, I don't have apostrophe, so I think... You're like Simpson's uh, donkey, you know? You, like... you, should, you should use your Shank's pony. Oh, use your Shank's pony. Yeah, yeah. No you, fucking you... idea what that is. <laughs> It's one of the most obscure ones I've ever heard. Uh, yeah. Go walking. Use your legs. Go walking. I don't know. All right. Use it's up there chance. with like. It's up there with like Buckley's, which is. Yep. Which I Buckley's I know is like Buckley's chance. So you've got no chance, right? Oh, no, Buckley's a, a teeth apparently. What? Ooh, apparently. I've only heard it as oh, you've got Buckley's, mate. You've got Buckley's chance. Who's no. Buckley? Okay, maybe this one. You've I think Nick, Nicky Buckley from Say Hello Century. From who? <laughs> this is an obscure yeah, reference. Yeah, very obscure. <laughs> Damn, I'm usually good with my references. All right, if you've had a prank, last one. You've definitely had yeah, a prank. Yeah, okay. For sure, you've been in a car crash or a crash of some kind or an accident. Like, exactly, exactly. Okay, your Australian might not be up to scratch, but that's, not, that, not that's a, okay. Not a valid citizen to pour me. This is going to be even more crucial because... Yeah, this will be worse. Uh, this will be... Yeah, this, I mean... If you get a couple of these ingredients, I'll be, I mean, I'll be ecstatic. Did you write, who, write, who writes the drinks? Is it a combination of you and David or, or, mm-hmm. or all these, your bad like boys? If we're, talking, if we're talking historically from the television show, then oh, I have no idea. And um, <laughs> neither of us have any experience in attending bar, so they're all bullshit anyway. So, uh, and you've never tried the drinks? Yeah, yeah, I've tr- we tried some. We did a stunt at some point where we made some of them. Um, some were okay, some were you know, hideous. Okay, let's go with the perfect Swiss kiss. There is one, two, three, five ingredients. Any five. Idea? Swiss kiss was uh, gold flakes were in there. Close, chocolate flakes. Chocolate flakes? It wasn't even any gold? Jesus Christ. God, no. is it... No, milk is but it should one. should be milk is one yes okay milk good good um uh what's the what's the alcohol um is there creme de menthe in it <gasps> creme something yes two parts creme, creme de, de cacao yes right that milk chocolate flake so we've got two more ingredients yes one of them is like no, I mean, not, not even really an ingredient. It's like, what do you pour it over? Oh, ice. Yes. And, but the alcohol, okay. you need the alcohol. Yeah, the alcohol is going to be the crux of it. 
Was it Kahlua? Vodka, no, we, unfortunately. We wouldn't have used vodka. Mm. There you mm. go. That was one of the better ones, as I recall. It's quite tasty. It does look tasty just reading it out. I think yeah. this one doesn't look tasty. Uh, the, the perfect beyond. The, so what was the worst beyond one? Beyond Chunder Dome. That's the, that's the one I was going to do next. Is that, how oh, you tried? Is that the one you're going to talk about? That's nine parts grape fruit flavored fruit drink or grape Cl- flavored like uh, close, close yeah. and no no it's one part it's it's whatever it's, it is it's a very small amount yeah four parts <laughs> cordial and then the rest is vodka and then you freeze it yes um was it was it specific about what it gets frozen in no, no but no. something to you serve it's in something specific sort of Something like beer pong cups, like plastic cups. Oh, yeah. 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 But nine parts vodka, four parts nine grape parts. fruit drink. Okay. Sure. <laughs> sure. That's, that's solid classic Chunder Dome. Yeah. Jesus. The perfect Heil Hitler. Any any ideas? Heil oh, Hitler? There's only, th- there's only three of that's, them. Um, I don't even remember where that came from. Uh, okay. That sounds like you can. We can skip it. What about the? Was that that was that was an apocryphal one that came from like the online episode or something? Maybe it was. I can't remember anything about it. Two parts dark rum, crushed ginger, filled with orange soda. Sounds okay. okay. I think this one okay. definitely was in the TV series, The Perfect Chinese Whisper. Yeah, Chinese. That's got lychee juice in it. Yes. Um, <laughs> God knows what else. There's so cream creaming soda? No, that's not a no, that's not the creaming not soda. Not that one. one. No. There's soda, is it? Nah, all well, I know is it's got lychee juice in it. Well, I think um let's I'm gonna try and lead you towards it. Something particularly with Asian kind of wine. Rice, Rice wine? Yes, that's it. Is it sake? Sake? It's sort what of, yeah, almost like, like sake. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, it's just an appropriation of Asian things. <laughs> what else is in there? Just instant ramen? Should have been. Be should have been. Um, uh, perfect fruit and carmen. I love fruit the and fruit Is and it fruit and come on? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have to be culturally accurate here. Um, There's four ingredients. Uh, four. Oh, well, there's ice probably. Um, oh, I think a lot of them have ice, yeah. One of them's pomegranate yeah, it's a free, syrup. It's a freebie. Pomegranate syrup. There we go. Another, another rum, juice. dark rum or spiced rum or something like that. A juice, pineapple juice. Yes. Pineapple, uh, and then the final ingredient will... Um, something tonic. Forever. What do you have in it? Something tonic. Gin? Yep. Yeah, that's it. That was the worst one. The fruit and kamun is, is like vomit in a in a cup. Christ, gin and pineapple juice and pomegranate. Pomegranate. Have you ever smelt pomegranate syrup? Was it pomegranate syrup? Yeah, it is. I haven't. That's, is it? It's hideous. <laughs> it's hideous. It's just like koala piss. Koala piss. I don't even know what koala piss was. But pineapple juice sounds better. Tasty, you know, I mean. Oh, pineapple juice is fine, but not when you put gin near it. That's like. Yeah, okay. That's the pon- okay. And uh, I think I have only got two more. There's the perfect fruit Madrid and the perfect bongo in Berlin. Do you know any one of those two? Uh, fruit Madrid. That's horrible too. Um, that was from the first episode in the television series. Can't remember a thing about it. And Bongo and Berlin it's from the web series. Can't remember a thing about it. No, but both have got ice. I'm going to go for the freebie. Uh, <laughs> Surprisingly, <laughs> they none of these ones have ice. <laughs> <laughs> the, the not even bo- the free. Not even the free point. Um, no, the Bongo in Berlin has dark rum. One squeeze one lime, fill with ginger mm. ale, and then it's served mm. in a beer stein, which is oh. as you do. Yeah, right. And the perfect oh, yeah. fruit Madrid has two parts grenadine, one part chartreuse. I hope that's how I'm say, pronouncing that. Yep. A pinch yep. of salt and a fresh yep. mint. Salt. That yeah. Grenadine and chartreuse. And then okay. Yeah. Do you know which one tasted the nicest off the top of your head? 
Yeah, it was the the um, Swiss one, the Swiss Kiss. That was great. That was fine. That was a cent- that was acceptable, palatable. Yep. Even the rest of them were just disaster. Yeah, I really like the name, the Swiss Kiss. It's just yeah, sounds like a thing. It just it sounds nice. I feel like I'm surprised it isn't like a drink already. And I hope somewhere someone can you patent drink names. I hope you could. Yeah, I wonder what that process involves. I have to bow down before some. Grand alcoholic. Uh, Dario, thank you so much. I've had such a pleasure talking to you, man. It's just been awesome. Like I said, I never thought I'd even get the chance to talk to you. So I genuinely want to let you know that it's awesome and I look forward to whatever you come up with next, honestly, even if it is just the, another Danger 5 Audible series. But I hope some of these projects get off the off the. I don't know, just leak them. Just leak them, I reckon. Yeah, just leak. That's <laughs> it. There's a full of Deadpool. That's what it's all. I'll do it. I'll do the trick. Are you, do you, I mean, could I expect something like your voice being lent to anywhere else? Like Michael Cusack? Would he have you on for this, the YOLO or anything like that? Well, he hasn't, hasn't, hasn't broached the issue. He's got, look, he's got a good crew of people that he, he works with. He doesn't have you, man. He doesn't have you. He doesn't have me, man. Doesn't need me. Nah, man. We all need you. Thing. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you. That's very kind. Thanks, thanks, for, thanks for the uh, chat and thanks for the impossibly soul-crushing quiz. And, uh, <laughs> you did well. I thought you did well on the, on the, oh, yeah. the uh, yeah, dream really. quiz. That's right. I'll, they'll, they'll come. They'll take my citizenship and uh, <laughs> I'll, know who, uh, I'll know who to blame. No, good, man. Thank you so much again. Have a lovely night. Hey. You too.